everybody. Welcome to the Online Report. Got a great guest today. This is a guy I've known for years, but I can't say I know a lot about him. That's about to change. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome IFBB Pro League professional and uh, president of Tuttle Nutrition, noted prep coach, Chris Tuttle. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Hey, how's it going, Ron? Thanks to be here. Going very well. Well, I've got a lot of questions. I'm going to get right into it. Uh, we're right. going to start way back in the beginning. You're 10 years old. You were diagnosed with hypoglycemia. Is this correct? Correct. It might have been a little younger than that. Uh, how old are you in third grade? Third grade, fourth grade? Around that time period. You might have been double promoted for all I know. But, uh, <laughs> so did that sort of have to make you eat the way bodybuilders eat from a very, very young age? Well, this is how it started. So I noticed when I would eat like any other kid, combos and chips and all crappy cereals and I didn't feel very good. Like I liked eating it, it was great eating it, but I'd soon after I feel I felt foggy, didn't feel very good. Then I usually an hour and a half, two and a half hours after I ate that, I'd feel nauseous and dizzy. Um, so I quickly started to realize that and like I would more opt to like to get a ham and cheese sandwich and potato chips. I wanted more real food, I would call it as a young kid. Um, so then I started going to school and every kid goes through that phase where like they don't like their bag lunch or mom gives them, you know. And I used to throw away the bag lunch, and I wouldn't eat during lunch. And oh. I started to go have hypoglycemic episodes, get dizzy, severe migraine headaches. Yeah. So luckily, my father's a physician. You know, my mom's like, something's wrong with him. We gotta, you know, we, I don't know what his problem is. He he gets nauseous. He needs to eat regularly. Could he be something going on with his pancreas? Hmm. So my dad did, you know, the whole blood sugar testing. He comes in, gives me a thing of orange juice with like 18 tablespoons of sugar or whatever it was, <laughs> my sugar adds to it. And then he tests my blood sugar, I drink it, and he tested it 30 minutes, 60, 90, 120 minutes, and it spiked, and then it plummeted after like 90 minutes. Hmm. He goes, usually, he goes, especially somebody your age, it stabilizes, it doesn't go down, 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 down. So usually from that point forward, like my foods, I intuitively would want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, not like you know, some more simple refined carbs as a kid. I wanted real food and I had to eat four or five times a day, usually at a younger age. Um, I didn't like fruit. I could never eat fruit. Like people would eat fruit as a snack. I would eat fruit and go hypo. Um, so I stopped doing that and that's how my first interest in food affected the way I felt at a very young age. Um, and then transferring into motocross, I had a trainer who used to be a bodybuilder and he was one hardcore son of a bitch. And uh, he taught me about like protein, combining proteins, carbs, and fats around the age of 11. And I started eating that way, and I felt great. And I was eating a good four solid meals a day, a meat, a protein, a starch. Uh, on a regular basis, I would bring food to class. I would put it in my book bag. I would eat in the <laughs> bathroom. I did whatever I could at a young age yeah. um, to, to, to fuel myself for racing. And that's really kind of what kicked off the whole nutrition part. So yeah, I was interested to learn that you were a professional motocross racer. How long yep. did you, you know, how long did you, you must have been doing that from a very early age. How long did you do it total, in total, and, you know, why did you get out I, of that? I started riding dirt bikes when I was four. Um, I started racing when I was 10, and I raced all the way through until I was 21. I coincidentally pointed up to professional status when I was 21 on my 21st birthday. Wow. Um, and then I only raced for about a half a season. I mean, at 21 years old, you're actually kind of, if you're not already at the top or close to the top, it's, yeah. you're kind of old for motocross. Wow. And, uh, I was spending like $30,000 a year racing and it's not like I was making good money. I was working at a gym as a personal trainer. I was going to college part time. So it wasn't feasible for my life to continue that path, living in my parents' basement, I wouldn't even spend 25 cents on a cup of coffee because every <laughs> single cent I wow. made went into like buying oil, racing, race fuel, yeah. and not to mention I would, I would break about two bones per year. Wow. Yeah. So. Okay. So I understand yeah. why you left. So did you start training for that or for some other sport or did you start weight training specifically for bodybuilding? Actually, the, the trainer I had for motocross at 11, he started putting me through a vigorous weight training program then. Hmm. And... I didn't know, like, this is this is really funny. So, he, you know, he had me do a lot of deadlifts, squats, high repetition, fast pace to build, you know, core strength, hips, quads, 
uh, mechanics, um, push-ups, sit-ups, a lot of basic stuff. But my body really responded fast, even at age 11. Huh. And I remember sixth grade, we're at this, like, picnic. And all these girls came over. They're like, oh, my God, Chris, you have abs. Oh, and I was, like, all cut up and shredded at, like, 11. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know girls like that. Huh. And I didn't know training gave you that look. I was just training to be a better motocross rider, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's when I started picking up muscle and fitness magazines, flex magazines, and other things being like, wow, I want to grow my chest more. I want to grow my shoulders more. But my trainer at the time was having a shit. He's like, dude, motocross and bodybuilding is like fire and water. He goes, mm. they don't go good together. He goes, you're going to be big. You're going to pump up on the bike. You're going to get slower. It's not going to work. You have to be athletic. You have to be fast and yeah. repetitious. So I would always lift behind his back and stuff like that. And I would get bad <laughs> arm pump for those of you out there listening who do race. I know all right, about that. Right. Like this on yeah. Huh. Oh, my God. Your forearm pump up is so bad you can hold on to the bars. <laughs> so that's what started it. In sixth grade and seventh grade and eighth grade, it was all about trying to get jacked but still be good at racing motocross. Yeah. Um, and my body responded really well. I remember being accused at like 13 years old of like the gym teacher being like, uh, you're not taking steroids, are you? And I'm like, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> um, remember, remember Jose talking about that? I think he was 13 or 14 in school, and they actually they drug tested him because so many kids were talking about him. Yeah, it's so funny. He was quite squeaky clean back in those days, so there was no problem. Yeah. So, the magazines you started looking at, who were some of the bodybuilders that sort of inspired you when you were starting out? Well, this is funny, right? So, I, I got in a lot of bad crashes. I crashed a lot. If, you know, if you're pushing the envelope, you're getting better, you're going to make mistakes. If you never crash, you're not riding fast enough. That's what my trainer used to say. <laughs> and uh, he go, I remember some of the doc, I'd go, I don't know, bang, get banged up, go to the hospital, and they'd be like, wow, I can't believe you're not, you're not broken. He goes, you're probably not broken because you're solid. you're a solid kid. You got a lot of muscle. So I'm like, oh, muscle protects my bones. Mm. So I used to pick up the magazines and be like, I'd be like, Dad, look at Lee Priest's back. I bet you if he fell off an 80 foot triple, he wouldn't break his back. <laughs> you know? A little do you know that's not true. But like, yeah. I was like, man, I got to build my back just like that. But I followed bodybuilding real young, was Dorian Yates, Nasser, Lee Priest. I loved Lee Priest. I was obsessed with him for the <laughs> longest time. I thought his stature, his build was just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I would buy all those magazines. I loved it. And at the time, my uh, sister's boyfriend was Chris Chin Um He uh -oh. was sponsored by Pro Lab way back in the day. So I idolized him and asked him a bunch of questions. And um, so that I had that going around and seeing it. But I, I didn't have anybody to bodybuild with. There was no coaches then. There's no knowledge on the internet. It was just picking up magazines and people you knew, you know? Right. Uh, it's uh – a lot of people don't realize, I, they, if they know anything about you, they know, you know, you're, you do prep coaching, but you have a much stronger background in the actual science of nutrition. You have a master's degree in nutrition, you're a registered dietitian, and you worked for some time in a, it was a hospital setting with, you know, overweight and diabetic patients? No, I, I worked, I floated, so I was a lot of the times an oncology floor, the GI floor, cardiac unit, and ICU. I was lucky. So, like, I wasn't a contracted employee. I worked close to 40 hours a week, but they just moved me as a filler. So I got to see everything. Okay. Um, so like, you know, I, TPN, nutrition, enteral nutritions, and all the feeds and the ICU. Then you're going to the cancer floor, dealing with people dying of cancer. And then you're going to the GI floor, and then the cardiac okay. unit. So you get to be well-versed in nutrition, med medical nutrition therapy, you know? Right. Um, so I did that for about four and a half years. And then the business became so big, I forced to quit. Right. So, you know, having that actual training and actual education, that must give you a certain advantage as a prep coach over, you know, a lot of guys who just have the bro science aspect of it and they'll look things up online or whatever. But, you know, you've actually had very formal education in this. Have you found that yeah. to be a benefit? It's a huge benefit, and this is why it's a benefit. I would say, you know, people are going to criticize you for saying this, but I would say, obviously, there's a lot of really good coaches out there that don't have those education credentials. And I will say 100%, a lot of them, Matt Porter, Jensen, a lot of them are very good, and I respect them. There's a large percent of coaches who just copycat. They don't understand. They follow progression where you just 
increase sups, you just decrease calories, you just increase cardio, and roll the dice, and then <laughs> it, it, seven out of ten guys look good, three look like crap. And yeah. then you get one good genetic freak who just cuts out McDonald's two weeks out, and then <laughs> the prep coach is a genius. I hate that guy. <laughs> yeah. So, like, there's, there's that. But what it's taught me, and especially my master's, is the whole master's program in nutrition that I did was all about research, research, research. What does nutrition, what does current day research state about nutrition and cancer, nutrition and alcohol, alcohol in the body, supplements yeah. and sports? So like how the class would run, there'd be like 30 people in our class, I would get a topic of do mega dosing antioxidants decrease morbidity, mortality rate in people with cancer. The next person would do higher fruit intake, vegetable intake in survival of cancer. Next person did this. At the end of the year, everybody presents their paper. I mean, at the semester, everybody presents their paper, and we all get to hear the conducting of research. Each paper was like 50 studies we had to review. So it goes quickly to show like how much studies are biased, how much studies are incorrect, how to feed through the crap. So a lot of times when people tell me things, I hear methods and stuff, and if they're really doesn't make sense or it's off the wall the masters kind of taught you through taught you to see through the crap you know what i mean because there's a lot of crap and it kind of broadens your horizons and opens your eyes to think outside the box undergrad almost makes you force yourself to look inside the box only hmm. the masters kind of broadened it being like well there's a whole other world outside the box that you learn that you know it's fact and research is still growing and changing yeah. so that's kind of the thing that's helped me the most do you find a lot of the research, you know, that people try to apply toward bodybuilding and toward the things we're trying to achieve doesn't really correlate to, you know, what healthy athletic people, and especially if they might be supplementing with, with drugs. It, there's a lot of research out there that doesn't really apply to us, even though people try to make it apply to us. Well, absolutely, because what they try to do is they try to use evidence being like, hey, this is what I do, evidence state that's right, yeah. when that's a bunch of crap. Because there's still things that work that people, doctors use in medicine to use to treat. They don't know how it works or why, but it does work. Yeah. And, and coaching, I think the biggest issue that people don't get, it's about a progression. It doesn't matter if it's low carb, high carb, low fat, whatever. If it's working, it's working. And then you go with progression and you keep making changes along the way. You can't have a preset determined plan. You can't, you know, certain research does work, obviously, how your body digests certain foods. But like... Yeah. But you're right, it doesn't apply directly. And I think that's some mistakes that people make. So They overanalyze it. it. I mean, think about it. 20 years ago, dudes are getting in shape. They didn't have all this quack-a-doodle crazy <laughs> stuff people do today, like all these like partitioners and like checking your blood sugar every hour and you carb up. Like, you know, it's silly. I agree. So uh, how did you – when did you get into competing? Because I can't remember hearing much about you until you came to Boston that – yeah, I knew who you were, obviously, but it didn't seem like you competed very often. You know, you won uh, some local, some regional shows, and you turned pro 2013 at the Nationals, and you've only competed twice as a pro, and you did pretty well. You did fifth in the, in the 212s of New York Pro, not as well at the other show, but, I mean, did are you just too busy as a coach to want to pursue competing more? Um, I'll tell you a quick, quick, uh, so I quit motocross 2004, yeah. And I, I knew I wanted to bodybuild. I always knew I wanted to, I just after racing motocross. And as soon as I quit, I, I said to my old man, I go, Dad, I got to get, get my shit together. I got to finish school, focus on my life, my career. I'm quitting racing. I sold all my bikes, all my stuff within two weeks, <laughs> um, moved out of my parents' house, got an apartment, and started bodybuilding and going to school full time. And I competed first in 2005. Okay. I usually average one or two shows per year, but... My school and improving in my life and career came first always. Yeah. And that's one big mistake I think a lot of people make because their whole life passes them by and then they're 40 years old and they're shit out of luck. I know that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the reason why I haven't been competing is freaking injuries, man. Um, I kind of have a stubborn mentality. Uh, hence, my father has like 18 operations and everything because he doesn't <laughs> listen to his body. I get it from him. Um <laughs> I hurt my knee getting ready for New York Pro, which I didn't tell anybody about, yeah. which was the start of chondromalacia in my left knee. Cool. And I came down in a squat to failure. It was like 17 reps. I came down. I felt a pop. And I racked it. And I walked to my buddy. I'm like, I think I hurt my knee. Within 10 minutes, I couldn't bend it. 
Mm-hmm. And that was 18 weeks out from New York Pro. So the whole New York Pro. That was this I, year. We're talking about this year, right? No, this is New York Pro 2000 before I did New York Pro. Oh, 2015 that you took fifth. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I didn't tell anybody because, you know, everybody starts talking all this weird crap on the internet. So uh, I, the whole prep, I didn't do anything more than like two plates and a leg press. And I was able to keep the leg mass enough to make it through. And then, but, you know, forcing yourself through still the training, even though you shouldn't be, is just going to accelerate arthritis. Mm. Um, so I let, the, I let the knee heal after New York Pro. Everything was doing great. Um, and then I did Europa. Um, I had ulcerative colitis, by the way. I, I, I don't know if you – yeah. I you had ulcerative that. colitis yeah. in 2013. And it, it, uh, for New York Pro, it was fine. And for Europa, it started to get bad. And for Europa, I couldn't carb up. I was eating only 20 carbs per meal to carb up because I did, I couldn't crap in like five days. Explain the joys of ulcerative, ulcerative colitis briefly for those who aren't familiar with it. I, ulcerative colitis is an irritable bowel disease. It's an inflammatory disease. It's generally in Jewish ancestry. Um, usually in individuals who have it or get flare-ups usually only have one or two in their life during a stressful time. Hmm. Some people are unlucky. And they get it so bad they have to part of their intestines removed. Yeah. I didn't have to have that. Or they're on some sort of prednisone or some serious autoimmune blocking drugs uh, to prevent the flare-ups from occurring. Yeah. Um, I opted out of the medicine and changed my lifestyle to a lower stress lifestyle and changed my diet. And it's kept it at bay. But it still comes back. And basically what it is is urgency to go to the bathroom up to 20 times a day shitting blood and mucus. Oof. Without stool. So you can be constipated but still go to the bathroom 20 times a day. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, it was horrible. It was, I mean, I'll tell you right now. I'm not afraid to say it. I mean, sometimes you don't make it. Like, you, like sometimes the flare-ups get so bad, and I know yeah. guys out there who have it, who contact me. Yeah. Like, you can't go anywhere. Yeah. And, like, you might be feel fine, and you're like, oh, I'm good. And then you have a bite of oatmeal, and 10 minutes later, you're like, oh, my God, my stomach's a mess. It's yeah. bloated, distended. Horrible. No, uh, but- I, I won't interrupt you too bad, but you know what C. diff is? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I had a, about a month-long bout with that last winter. And let me tell you, anybody with colitis, I feel you, and I know exactly how bad it sucks. It was it was like the worst yeah. month of my life. So go ahead continue. <laughs> it's, it's funny. It's like all the things you take for granted, just a good solid shit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you get that taken from me, boy, your life gets miserable real fast. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I controlled it to New York Pro. Uh, it went very smooth prep. Europa, just dieting for so long, doing so much. It started to get worse over the last few weeks. And then I told Aceto, I'm like, Aceto, man, I, I'm having trouble eating food, like especially carbohydrates. Carbohydrates bother it the most. And yeah. we started to carb up, and it didn't work, and I looked like total ass. Um, so I was planning on competing again the year after and doing like five shows. I was ready to compete. I want to compete, compete, compete. Sure. And then I hurt my knee catastrophically again. Oof. And being a knucklehead, I was like, man, like, ah, oh, I just got to hang in there. I think it's fine. I kept training the week after. And I'm like, ah, oh, I just won't do that exercise because that bothers me. I'll do this instead. Yeah. And then eventually that exercise started to hurt. And eventually all exercise started to hurt. And then I'm like, you know what? I need to rest the knee. I rested for three weeks. I come back. The knee's 10 times worse than it was. Wow. And I'm like, then I went to go see all these professionals and – He's like, you got 50% of the cartilage on your kneecaps missing. He goes, <sighs> he goes, your he goes, your meniscus. He goes, it's fully intact. He goes, your patella. He goes, it's destroyed. He goes, partially because your hips are off, so you kind of favor your right leg. So when you train to failure, the left leg comes forward more, grinding your femur into my patella. Hmm. So it was a mechanical issue over time that wore out the cartilage in the knee. Hmm. So here I am with, you know, every time I go to lunge, I can actually hear my knee cracking and popping yeah and i'm slowly getting back i mean not to go to all the whole story but 15 months it's been 16 months now and i'm just able to squat 225 yeah wow i mean have you been doing a ton of rehab for it ton of rehab every day of my life wow but the leg is so incredibly weak compared to my right it's it's like it just the quad just doesn't want to fire you know the quads like been dormant for so long and the glute atrophied so now there's a major muscle balance so it's been getting the glute strength back, hamstrings back, getting the quad back. And I could tell you, I couldn't even do the chest and the leg press with no weight. Hmm. But now I'm, I came up to five plates. I can do it comfortably. Just training to failure is difficult because the left leg is so much weaker than the right leg. And then I just completely compensate. 
But it's getting better, and I love bodybuilding. A lot of guys are going to want to hear therapies, specific therapies you're doing, because I, I guarantee you there's a lot of guys listening who have knee issues that would love to hear how you're coming yeah. back from this. Um, well, I saw three specialists, you know, just general orthopedic surgeons, and he goes, there's nothing they can do surgically-wise. He goes, he goes, if I do in surgery, he goes, it might be better, it might not. He goes, but you're going to be on crutches for four weeks. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. Saw one of those uh, doctors that do the PRP injections and the, the you know, those all those other alternative treatments he paid a pocket. Yeah. And he even said, it's probably not going to do much. Hmm. And he goes, you, you could spend fifteen to 3000 bucks, and it gets a little better. He goes, but he goes, your knee's functional, Chris. He goes, but you getting under a bar and squatting 500 pounds, he goes, that's probably not ever going to happen because you have structural damage. Hmm. He goes, you're going to have to learn to train around it and do different things to try to stimulate the muscles to grow, hmm. which I'm doing. So really, the main focus in rehab currently is deep tissue massage, correcting muscle imbalance, working the weak areas, working the legs individually, and making sure my hips stay flexible enough because the weaker side muscles get tighter, pulling on the knee, making my mechanics off, which hurts my knee. Okay. Uh, you know, there's a, pause, there's, a, there's a silver lining in every cloud, and the pictures of your upper body lately, just it's enormous. So <laughs> looks like yeah, you've been able to apply some of that energy toward your upper body a little bit more. Yeah, it, it just time, man. Like, Ron, like, people are like, I get clients who are ready to jump the deep end over tendonitis in their elbow. And I'm like, dude, you have no idea. But, like, I love bodybuilding. It makes me happy to live the lifestyle. I'm never going to stop living the lifestyle. I'm going to train. And I'll continue to keep working way back to maybe eventually one day hit the stage again. Yeah. But it doesn't hold me down. It doesn't make me sad because my situation is my situation. And I have to make the best of it. That's it. You know? Yeah. So, so how did you start getting prepping people? How did Total Nutrition start? Ah, this is a good story. Yeah. My first show went horribly. I placed last, hired some guy, didn't do well. So I picked up all Chris Aceto's books. I read every book. And uh, I actually tried to hire him back in 2005, but he wouldn't help me. He was like, you know, I'm just a new guy. He's a young kid. <laughs> right. And uh, so I read all his books, and I did my own prep. And the following year, I won the Novice Novice overall in second in the Open, and I jumped 13 pounds of weight. So I'm like, oh, wow. So this kid at the gym goes, holy shit, man. He goes, you made crazy ground the last year. He goes, can you help me with my prep? And I go, I mean, I'm not like co people today where people do one show and they're professional coaches. I said, man, I go, I don't know what I'm doing. I go, I did two shows. I prep myself. I, I, I mean, I have an idea of what I did and it seemed to have worked. Yeah. I go, I go, give me 25 bucks. I go, I'll help you for your prep. You know? So I helped him. I helped him and he did better. And then his friend goes, hey man, you did a lot better than last year. What did you do differently? And he goes, my friend at the gym helped me out. And he goes, well, can you put me in touch with him? And basically, that's how it started in 2006. It was referral, word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth. And then over the years, I helped more and more people, more word spread. And then I started to get more wins, more client overall wins, and a couple client IV pro cards. And then now I have clients in other countries. And now now it just – I don't advertise. I think people who advertise and they're like, come on now. Come on to my plan. Why the discount lasts is just so yeah. corny. Three spots, of, three spots available. Yeah, that means you have every spot available. Right. But like I just – this is a happen, re referral, you know, and help – I love helping people, Ron. Like my dad's a physician. You know, most every my family are doctors. So like mm -hmm. we come from a whole – line of like helping people for a yeah. living and I deeply enjoy helping people. That's probably my true passion now more than competing myself. Okay. I love seeing my clients do well more than anything. Now, uh, I, I saw 20 pro cards so far. Maybe it might be more by now because I don't think you've updated that in a little while. So who are, I saw some familiar faces on the Instagram, but who are some names that like the viewers would know that you've helped turn pro? Uh, Linda Stevenson. She's a IFE figure pro. Yeah. Uh, Mark Duvall, who never competed again after he won the Masters uh, at North Americans. Uh, uh, rude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got. He's really good too. He can be good. Um, uh, Sue Ellen Dent, for oh, yeah. pro in fitness. Yeah. I had another fitness girl turn pro at second at Team Universe. Yeah. Um, who else turned pro? But Brennan Floyd, men's physique pro, IP pro. I have a bunch of natural pros, like at least ten of them. Right on. Okay. Uh, who else? Who else is missing, Lex? 
I mean, I saw a picture at Powerhouse. I think that's where it was. It was a massive group picture. You know, you were in the middle, and there had to be like 30, 40 people in the picture. It was all it was all clients, all time yeah. nutrition clients. So, yeah, yeah. we do uh, we do team lifts and stuff like that. I mean, I like trying to be personal with people. Like some people don't talk to their clients on the phone. I mean, if they want to do it that way, that's fine. But I like being personal. Most of my clients end up being friends with, you know. And I like that camaraderie, you know, like I had one of my clients in Germany I've been working for working with for a few years and I, I invited him to come stay with me. I'm like, dude, you want you can come to US, man. You can stay in my house. And he came for a whole week, him and his wife. We trained every day, ate, wow. and it was it was a blast, you know, yeah. um, but I, I like that. Cool. It's like I'm not a very social person, Ron. So it's like <laughs> for, for me to be like for me to like get to meet people and still work and be yeah. social is like a plus. <laughs> So, you know, that's obviously you, you have a lot of enjoyment out of it. What's, what's one thing that's challenging about being a prep coach? Challenging is different people's personalities. You know, like, you know, it, 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 chal the most challenging thing is people don't follow directions. Mm. You might say, hey, man, I need you to do this at 5, do this at 4, do this at 10. And they're like, okay, I did it at 10 and I did it at 2. I'm like, well, that's not quite what I said. Yeah. You know, like, well, I didn't think it'd make a difference. I'm like, well, clearly it does make a difference because that's what I said to do. Um, but I mean, the difficult, you know, what difficult thing is, is the new generation today. Mm. The new generation is, I want to be professional. I want to be sponsored. My response, oh, you ever competed before? Oh, never. Oh, have you ever watched a show? No. Okay. I mean, I, I as a kid, you never want to be a professional basketball player if you haven't played basketball before. Right. Right. Right, and I think sometimes the the difficulty getting to them because they're so overly enthusiastic about achieving, yeah, but they have no idea the right. level of time, effort, and work it could put in and still not pay off. Yeah, and that's life. That's a difficult thing I think with the younger generation that I try to tell them, and I don't sugarcoat things. I'll tell them flat out, and sometimes they don't like it, and they go somewhere else, and that's right. fine. Um, and the other thing I don't like is. You know, I really give it my all a lot of my clients, and obviously you can't make everybody happy. Yeah. And then, like, you know, you give it your all, and they don't follow directions, and they point the finger. Mm. And it, I don't take it personally more, and I've only had two people in the last 10 years that were a problem. Yeah. But like, I mean, at that point, th that is disheartening sometimes when you know you put all you can into something. Yeah. And they still look at you, you're like, you failed me, you know? <laughs> Have, have you ever busted people like on Instagram when they're out drinking or posting pictures where they're eating cheesecake or something when they know damn no. well they're not supposed to be? No, but you know what's funny is my clients narc on other clients <laughs> all the time. They'll send me a picture. They're like, would you say so-and-so's refeed supposed to be? And I'm like, oh, just like a stack of pancakes, like four pancakes and a side of egg whites. And he goes, you mean this? And sends me a picture of it and it's like <laughs> the exact opposite of like – Chocolate and ice cream and all this stuff. Yeah. What are a couple of the most common myths that you think clients have, you know, embedded in them about prep, about dieting that you have to sort of dispel from the start? One, that you can't predetermine peak week four weeks out. That drives me nuts. People who are competing for five weeks, I mean, five years of their life, they ask me, hey, what does peak week look like? Yeah. I don't know. We're 10 weeks out. <laughs> I don't even know five days out. Yeah. It's day by day at that point. That's one. Two is everybody thinks they can look like somebody else. Yeah. Wouldn't that be That's nice the stuff? difficult thing to grasp. Or like there could be – there's people out there, no matter how hard you work, will beat you flat out working half as hard as you. Yeah. And they have trouble grasping that, and they start pointing fingers on why, you know? Right. Like someone said to me the other day to my clients who goes, uh, we're backstage, like five of us. And he goes, how come I'm not – I feel like I'm flat. Why am I as full as him? I go. He's got. He's got. He's got muscle belly. He's like Phil Heath, man. I go. That is his flat. Yeah. I go. That's your full, which looks flat. Right. But that's just your genetics, man. You can't ever get muscle bellies like that. You can build on what you have and perfect it and progress. But you got to stop comparing yourself to other people. Mm. You can do that in the sense of like strive to look like somebody. But the chances are you're never going to have quads exactly like his. Right. And that is very difficult for people to grasp because you get these personal trainers today who are like, oh, I can get your biceps to peak like this. I sure. can get your chest to full like Johnny Jackson. All you got to do is train like this. And that is a hard thing to break with people, I think. Right. right. And they still don't get it. Well, I mean, well, I mean 
I, I deal with that all the time, and I think it's just it's it's easier to delude yourself into thinking that than to accept that this is my this is a reality for me. No matter you know, like people use like drugs. Oh, if I was uh, if I had the same drugs as Big Rami, I'd look like no. You would not look like Big Rami. You would not yeah. look like Kai Green. You would not like look, look like Phil Heath. Not in a million years, because you didn't have their parents. It's 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 hard. Re it's a very hard reality, bitter pill to swallow. Ron, you know what I like? You know what analogy I like? What? And I go, it's funny that you know, say a good prep coach does a lot with the good people, right? Yeah. And they go, I got to work with him. Now, remember in college, where you have a good teacher and five kids get straight A's. No one's like, man, I got to go see Dr. Brown. <laughs> biology because he's producing straight A students. Right. It's like, no, man, you got to work. And there's right. some kids in that class who got to work a hell of a lot harder than others to get the same grade. And right. that's how bodybuilding is. Yep. And you still might fail the class still, you know? Right. I mean, do you, do you also have people coming to you like wanting you to guarantee a victory or guarantee a pro card when they don't have any idea who they're going to be standing up there against, but they want that guarantee? I shut them down right away. Mm. I don't let I don't let my clients talk like that. If they're like, Chris, do you think I'm going to win? I go, honestly, I go, don't ask me that. I go, because how do you determine that? You can't determine that. That's like you're training all year to play the playoffs and basketball, and you're like telling the coach, coach, are we going to win? I don't know. It depends how you play. It depends how they're going to play. Right. You don't know, you don't know any of that. They right. want the guarantee because the insecurity, you know? Right. It makes right. you feel confident. And I'll say, well, given how you're looking, you'll be competitive. Depending sure. who shows up is going to determine the placing. Yeah. That's it. Oh, yeah. So you know when I met you, you were training with Evan. So how did you how did you get to know Evan, and how long did you train with Evan for? Oh, I've known Evan forever. So I remember I met Evan at Arnold. Yeah. Two thousand four, and. I just met him. I didn't really say anything. I just like he shook his hand and be like, "Oh, nice to meet you." You know, I'm from Connecticut too. And then I saw him at the gym at Powerhouse one day. And he goes, dude, he goes, Chris, I remember you. He goes, you live in Connecticut. He goes, you train here? And I go, yeah. And he goes, dude, let's train. And he invited me to train because I was going to school in New Haven at the time. And I was going between classes. And he trained around 10, 11 o'clock. So that's when I started training with him. And that was 2000, 2007. I trained him 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. I trained for a good year straight when I was in college, and man, that was such a blast. It was like, go to class, eat fish and rice at biology <laughs> at like 9 o'clock in the morning, race to the gym, change, train with Evan, puke, and then go back to back to school in my dirty clothes, and then it was a great time, man. That's how, that's how I first met Evan, and then we became friends, and we've been friends ever since, and we see eye to eye in a lot of things, so we get along. Yeah. No, um... You don't train. I assume you don't live in that area. You don't train at Powerhouse New Haven anymore. Uh, I do train Powerhouse on the weekends. I I live forty five minutes from there. Yeah. Um. So I mean, I do drive distance to gyms, but during the week, you know, I, I gotta be fast. So I I train at a local gym around here during the week and train at Powerhouse usually on the weekend, or I travel to a different gym in the weekend when I have more time. Cool. So NPC Nationals is coming up. I imagine you probably got a few people on that show. So what does like that, that week look like for a, a good prep coach who's attentive to a few different people for those last, say, four or five days leading up to a, the show? Yeah, I have, a, I think, five people, five. Um, one, a couple really, really, really good ones. Um, it, it's attention to detail, you know. I tell my clients, you got to send me pictures that are in consistent lighting. I hate when people send me selfies <laughs> in, like, the craziest lighting with a filter. Yes. If the pictures make you look better, you're doing me a disservice. Mm -hmm. If the pictures make you look slightly worse or actual reality, then we're doing good. But uh, Ben, for example, Ben Ralphala, um, I mean, we're a week out now to New England's, and we're doing pictures almost every day, wait every day. I've talked to him every day for 30 days now, mm -hmm. um, but keeping everything right on the money because some people's bodies change fast. They flatten out for no reason. They get lack of sleep or whatever. Um, but changes will be there, and I'm staying with him uh, in Miami um, in his, one of his friend's apartments. Hmm. But generally, just pay attention to detail and answer your phone. Like, <laughs> I, I hear a lot of complaints about, like, oh, coach is not answering phones the day of the show. If you don't do that, you're an asshole. Yeah, if, you can't, if you can't help somebody, just say you can't help them. Don't right. say you're going to help them and leave them high and dry. Mm. I mean, if they don't 
follow suit with your instructions and then try to blame you. That's a different story, of course. Yeah. But I mean, like, uh, communication's vital. I'm glued to my phone. I had 14 people compete last Saturday, and I think my battery was dead at like 1 p.m. <laughs> and I'll, but like, you know, I just, you got to be on the ball, you know, and you got to calm people down. Because you, when you're dieting, you're very neurotic, you know, yeah. you're dehydrated and you're ready to flip your lid over the smallest stuff, you know. I'm, I'm flattening out, flattening out. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, calm down. <laughs> I mean, you do have to be a little bit of a therapist. A big, yeah. a big part of it. That's a big part of it, obviously. Yeah, you got to know how to talk to people and work with people. You know, you can't you can't dictate and scream at them. It doesn't. You can't do that. You know. So you have the TuttleNutrition.com website. You have uh, your YouTube channel is Tuttle is also Tuttle Nutrition. Yep. You guys have been putting out a, a lot of content, but you know, it's it's a team effort. It looks like. Uh, is your wife Alexia a really big part of this whole business operation? Now? Oh my God! If if it wasn't for her, I swear I'd be belly up. She's uh she has her own clients. You know, she's got some bikini clients and some weight loss and. She manages all the tech stuff, all the books, all the billing. Um, I just answer emails. That's all I want to do is answer emails, deal with clients. I don't want to deal with taxes. I don't want to know how much we're writing. I don't want to know any of that. But she deals with all that, and we both work full-time. We work a lot, but we both work time, full-time at home together. Uh, we do everything together now, making videos together, putting more content out. I just like We just like helping people. You know, We just spent – Couple grand making some videos for cooking videos for our clients to watch because a lot of things to you and I are very simple to understand. General public don't understand how you can like cook a bunch of food without cooking in oil and cooking it in butter, you know. So there's a huge deficit of knowledge there that I think needs to be portrayed because there's a lot of misinformation. And I think if people see how simplistic it could be, uh, they have an easier time eating or healthy and better their lifestyle. All right, so the contest season is almost over, but we also have, you know, a lot of guys and girls are going to be in the off-season mode, and I'm sure you work with people in that phase of their training and everything as well. You know, do you enjoy that equally well as you do contest prep? I don't know. I, most of my clients, we have a lot of clients, and we have a lot of competitors, but the majority of our clients are like nutrition medical therapy, a lot of weight loss, high cholesterol, ulcerative colitis, uh, a couple of diabetics. Um, I had leaky gut syndrome recently. I get a lot of GI disorders. I get a lot of people that way because of my credentials, and I'm in a few chiropractic offices and doctor's offices. They recommend me um, based on what I've done with their clients and weight loss, getting them off their meds or blood pressure meds and all that stuff. We do a lot of that. Um, I just like seeing people win. I want people to reach their goal, whether it's bodybuilding or not. Um, contest season is hectic because, you know, obviously when the spring starts – at one, at one point, Lexi and I, we had a show to go to like 11 weeks in a row. So it's like we're working Monday through Friday. We're at the show Saturday, catching up Sunday, repeat for 11 weeks straight. Yeah. Um, so like it gets hectic. And I, I, I love to go to my client shows, but I can't go to all of them, you know? Right. Especially if they're like four-hour driving distance. Yeah. I know that I should have mentioned this earlier, but I want to throw this in just because it's a, it's a little feather in your cap. You're also a guest lecturer in nutrition. University of St. Joseph and the American International College in the School of Health Sciences. I don't know too many, too many prep coaches who are asked to do some things like that. So props to you, guy. Um, it, it, this is really funny. So getting ready for Cutler 2012, remember? Yeah. I think that's where I met you, actually, officially met you. I, I won so, yeah. Cutler 2012, and I was presenting my thesis two days before uh, the show. I remember my mom being like, this is a bad idea. You should be focused on your school. I'm like, mom, shut up. I got it. <laughs> and uh, I presented my thesis really well because you're low carb, you're tired. I was just very focused, not nervous. I just wanted to get it done. Hmm. And I remember my advisor being like, Chris, you speak unbelievably. <laughs> They're like, I can't believe how well you presented that. And then from that point forward, she always asked me to come back to speak to the graduating kids about jobs and and because I, I fit a different niche of dietitian where yeah. I'm not generally in long-term care or whatever I do my own thing so I'm a specialty so University of New Haven still asked me back to speak to their alumni I mean to the uh, graduating class about different directions or paths and uh, I did a lot of nutrition speaking for um, a couple of police stations too and fire stations Wow and then uh, just general nutrition how to be healthier because you know a lot of the times, firemen becoming more and more unhealthy, high cholesterol, becoming overweight, mm -hmm. COPD. So I come in there and help them understand basic nutrition because all the guys cook and eat there together, you know? Right, right. And then the 
the nutrition. I taught the nutrition segment for a little bit. Uh, the speaker at the International College in Springfield to the physical therapy students. I did that for a few years in a row, and that, and that was cool. You know, you you meet new people, and I've always been good at speaking. After I became good at speaking, um, when I was younger, Ron, I used to throw up and pass out in high school when I would speak. <laughs> so <laughs> I refused. I would take F's in every class wow. and had to speak in front of the class. And in my first year in college, I'm like, man, I got to man up and grow a set. I got to man. I got to do this. So I took uh, um, intro to public speaking, advanced public speaking. And then all through my internship to be a dietitian was all public speaking. I had to speak in front of women and breastfeeding. <laughs> I'm the only guy in the I'm only guy in my in my class speaking with women about breastfeeding, latching on production, everything. And I got a reward at the end of the year for public speaking for doing so well. And I became a niche with it. So that's I think some of the reasons why people ask me. You know, I was a little quick. I'm not nervous, awkward. You know. Right. And you know. I assume when they first see you, they're like, huh, you know, this big muscle head. But it's, once you start speaking, I'm sure they, there any misconceptions they might have had about your preconceptions. Probably yeah, well, what's good, Ron, is I hide pretty well under clothes. Everybody always says that, you know. And uh, I always wear baggy clothes, and I really try to not fit that part in the professional field because, as you know, it's a definitely a negative connotation for the majority yeah. of the general population. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I look fit, I look muscular, but I try to hide it as best I can. And because I do have narrow clavicles, I can hide it, and yeah. uh, it works out good. Some someone like Evan, no such luck. Yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> Some people can't hide anything in a shirt. <laughs> it's like trying to hide a gorilla or a giraffe or something. Good luck. Yeah, right. Cool. Well, Chris, it has been so good talking to you. I've learned a lot more, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people watching this are, are happy that they finally know a little bit more about you. Uh, I'll probably see you. You're going to New England, I assume, Saturday. Yeah, Ron, I'm going to New England and Nationals and Easterns. Okay, well, I'll catch you with two out of those three for sure. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, getting uh, this interview done for the for the people that follow on MD, and wishing you the best as always. You and your wife Alexia, great people. Thanks, so, Ron. For the Ron Line Report, it's been Ron Harris with Chris Tuttle. Thanks, Chris. <laughs>